Hello, and welcome to Great Times Behind the Wines. This show is for wine lovers of all backgrounds who are curious about the behind the scenes world of a family owned winery in New York State's Finger Lakes wine country. I'm your host, Shannon Hazlitt Hart. Hope you have your sweet tooth ready because today's episode is all about dessert wine. So, we are talking to the masterminds of two of Hazlitt's dessert wines, the Solera Sherry and the Vito Blanc Ice Wine. Sounds like my tabby cat Hoover, who often joins me as I'm making this show, is ready. First, we'll chat with Tim Benedict, Vice President of Cider and Winemaking. He's the expert on the Solera Sherry, which is aged in barrels using a special process he'll explain called the Solera Method. Then, we'll hear from Michael Reedy, Vinifera winemaker, about our very special Vito Blanc ice wine. Tim, thank you so much for sitting down with me today to talk about the Solera Sherry. Could you please start by describing its unique history? Sure. Well, we purchased the uh, Widmer, the old Widmer facility in Naples, New York, back in, well, we purchased it in 2010. We took ownership of the facility in uh, New Year's Day, 2011, and the Widmer family and, and the other owners after that had a long history of all the wines they made there going all the way back to 1888 when... Will Widmer made started making wine in his basement of the house, and they built their first winery in 1890, and it just went on from there to be one of the largest, most successful wineries in the Finger Lakes back in that day. And one of their flagship products was their Solera Sherry that they actually would bake on the roof in barrels, and. We have old pictures from back then where there was just literally hundreds of barrels stacked up on the roofs of that facility. When we came across the facility, there were actually a few barrels left of the old sherry, and I think the parts of the Solera from the records that we saw dated back to 1988, which is kind of funny that they started in 1888, but there was there was some sherry, sherry and part of the Solera was, was 1988, and then several other uh, batches up through the 90s, and, I, and I'll explain how that works in a minute. But we talked about um, making sure that those barrels stayed behind once, uh, once the former owners left, and they were agreeable to that. And I was able to track down a few of the old winemakers that are still alive, and they were very gracious about uh, talking with me about their history with the sherry, and I got a pretty good idea of how it was made and what grapes it was made from, and we thought that that would be pretty cool to continue that tradition on and keep making that product. And it's and it's worked out really well. We've we took that very first seed of the the Solera and we've added two different batches to it. We're getting ready to add a third. This interview is being recorded in September 2020 for context. Thanks for sharing all of that awesome history, Tim. Could you please also share with us some feedback you've received about the Solera Sherry? It's been really well received. It, it was, uh, it's won a lot of awards. It actually took best of show at the state fair one year out of all the wines entered. And it's just, it's so much fun to bring it out and, and pour a little for somebody that's never had it before. So it's, cause it's so unique. So the way a Solera works, it, um, Solera actually is, a a Spanish term that means on the ground. So if you were to picture a stack of barrels that let's say they're they're four or five high, a big row of barrels, but they're stacked up, you would you would put wine in the bottom row and then you'd probably leave it there for quite a while building your solera. And the bottom row is called the solera. And the rows above them are called craderas. So you'll have the solera would be the bottom row, the next row up would be the first cradera, and then the second and the third. And the, and, and I think you can go in some point, this, this technique is really popular in uh, Spain and Portugal. And I've heard of uh, as many as 14 different craderas that would go into the whole thing. So how, how this all works, it's called fractional blending. So when, when it's time to take wine out of the Solera to be bottled, you don't empty the barrel. You don't empty each barrel. You may only take half of it out. And everybody has their own technique. Do they take a third out? Do they take a half out? 
but they leave some in there. And then the wine in the next row up, in the first Cordera, you take wine out of that to fill the Solera. And then you take wine out of the second Cordera and you fill the first Cordera. And so on and so on as you go up. And the neat thing about that is that the, the barrels never get emptied out. So our Solera that goes back to 1988, there will always be some of that wine forever because you never really empty the barrels. And then, like I said, we're doing another batch now and that will go on the top row to help fill up the top row. And, and, and that's how that works. So it's a fascinating process. Yeah, it really is. Thanks for the great description. What would you say are some challenges of making the Solera Sherry? Well, one of the challenges is hauling all those barrels up on the roof. And and there are some challenges with, there's some losses that you have when you have barrels in the sunlight up on the roof. They could, they call they used to call it the angel share because there's a little bit of evaporation. And um, sometimes it's, it's a challenge to keep the barrels sound that are out in the weather all the time, keep them from leaking and, and that sort of thing. So I'd say that was, that's probably the biggest is, is maintaining the barrels. Yeah, but how big are they? They're just regular wine-sized barrels, um, probably 53-gallon barrels. H- how many are there out of curiosity as well, usually? We're somewhere in the 30, 35 barrels in ours it's not it's not huge i mean we wanted to keep on the tradition but cream sherry is not only is it not your mother's wine it probably wasn't even your grandmother's wine or maybe it was your grandmother's wine but it's it's kind of fallen out of favor i i'd love to see a sherry renaissance and and have it it seems like everything comes back around eventually so it'd be nice to have it uh become popular again but we we don't really need to produce a whole lot of it. Um, so our our uh, Solera is kind of modest compared to what, what once took place over there. Very cool. And you mentioned that it's a cream sherry. Can you describe the different types of sherry and what the cream sherry might mean? Well, there's, there's two main types. One would be a dry sherry and one would be a cream sherry. And the cream sherry just refers to a sweet sherry as opposed to a dry. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> and um, are you able to reveal what kind of grapes you use to make the sherry? I am not, because it's a tightly guarded secret. Oh, yes, of course. Well, thanks for keeping that secret. Now, out of curiosity, is there a certain age that the solera or base layer has to be? The, the average age is seven years. So you want to want to make sure that everything in that bottom solera is at least seven years old. About how much would you say you leave in there? We do about half, yeah. We'll, we'll empty the barrels about halfway and then put the next layer down. Oh, wow. That was a lot more than I was expecting, to be honest. Like, I, I kind of thought it was, like, smaller, you know, amounts. So, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, there's different, I, I think there's probably different secrets to different producers. But we, we go about half. Yeah. And what kind of barrels do you use? Well, well, I, I guess I can give that secret away. We actually um, followed the old Widmer uh, recipe and we use um, once used whiskey and bourbon barrel which is funny because that's a thing now I've seen that in the stores and I've actually tried a few of having red wine aged in bourbon barrels and rum barrels and that's become really popular just within the last year or two we've been doing it forever well for 10 years anyway yeah wow definitely above the curve there that's awesome <laughs> And you mind just describing some of the qualities that aging it in those types of barrels might give the sherry? Well, it has it has a tiny bit of that uh, bourbon uh, whiskey kind of character to it, but most of the character of the wine comes from the baking in the sun, and that's where the sugars get caramelized, and you really get a lot of nutty and honey type flavors and. A little bit of apricot, too, I think, as far as the fruit goes. But a lot of it's very dark, uh, very kind of brownish dark from the baking and uh, the caramelized sugar and the honey and 
and then the fruit flavors. It's it's very unique. Mm, oh, wow. Yes, yeah, sounds amazing. I feel like you described it just everything I get when I try it as well. Would you say you have a favorite food to pair with this Solera Sherry? I believe our marketing director mentioned that an Almond Joy candy pairing for Halloween is pretty good. Uh, are there some other festive ideas you may have for serving Sherry around the holidays? Well, that that's a pretty cool idea. I mean, Almond Joy is my favorite candy bar, so I can't can't argue against that. But I think Sherry, it's it's technically classified as a dessert wine. I, I think it's a dessert all by itself, but maybe some strong cheeses or even a cigar would be a pretty good pairing with it. Certain type of cheese, would you say? No, just something really sharp and strong. All right. And do you have a favorite experience uh, involving making or sharing the sherry with someone that you'd like to describe? Well, the experience was just the, my favorite memory was just the, the first time we put those barrels up and stacked them on the roof. And just to know that we were carrying on a tradition that that had gone on for several generations in right here in the Finger Lakes. So that was pretty cool. Thanks so much to Tim Benedict for sharing that amazing information with us about the Solera Sherry. Now let's hear from Michael Reedy, vinifera winemaker, about the Vida Blanc ice wine. In case you were wondering about the term vinifera, it refers to grapes that originate in Europe. These include some you may have heard of, such as Riesling, Merlot, and Gewürztraminer. Vinifera often grow beautifully here due to climate similarities between the wine regions. Michael works at the original Hazlitt Tasting Room location in Hector, New York, on the Seneca Lake Wine Trail. Michael, could you please describe the ice wine and why it's a bit different than other wines we have here at Hazlitt? So, I mean, ice... Ice wine, the big thing is everyone always looks at ice wine and says, why is it so expensive? Well, it's expensive because real ice wine is made taking a, it's, it's a risk, it's a gamble. So to make true ice wine, what you need to do is you leave the grapes on the vine through harvest, through the fall, into the winter, and typically harvest happens somewhere after the first of the year. And what happens is it's sitting out there, these vines, are, the grapes are sitting out there, um, they will start desiccating, so they're losing a little bit of moisture from just being, it, it's dry outside. It's like you have to run the humidifier in the wintertime, so it's drying, so they're losing some of their, their moisture that way. Uh, botrytis might be out there, and what botrytis is doing is um, it's changing things, so that's having an aspect. Michael was giving such a great description of the ice wine making process, I didn't want to slow him down during our interview to fully describe botrytis, but I'll just give a quick description here. It's a fungus that grapes are susceptible to. Under the right conditions, it can cause noble rot, which helps create some of the world's finest sweet white wines. But also the grape skins themselves are starting to degrade and elements of the, of the grapes are just changing. Chemically, they're, they're, they're starting to, I wouldn't say rot, but they're, they're starting to just transform themselves. So basically, it's a, you know, fermentation is a term that's used, a lot of people just employ um, in terms of alcoholic. Fermentation is basically a, is, is a, change it's a chemical change from one thing to another so pickles are fermented you know kimchi is fermented it's they're not making alcohol they're you know something is acting and changing it to something else and it's usually through a bacteria or yeast so things are happening out there flavors are changing so when would you say these grapes going through all of these changes are ready to pick uh you wait for the wines the grapes to freeze and you pick it at we don't have any set rules, but we typically go by what the Canadians do is they call it a VQA, which is a, it's a guideline that says temperature should be between 18 and 15 degrees Fahrenheit during the entire process of picking and pressing. So you're picking basically marbles. And what's happening is you're bringing them in. And so you've, you know, and you're squeezing them. And when you squeeze them, you're getting maybe a third of what you would have gotten in terms of volume, if you were just brought the grapes in right as ripe grapes at 20, 22% sugar, like you typically do at harvest. So right there, you're getting a third of something. So the cost has just gone up. The chance of it not freezing is potential because maybe it doesn't get cold enough one year. So you can go out there and do a late harvest, but you're basically taking a chance. There's also things in the vineyards like turkeys, deer, um, that have no food source, especially when there's snow cover. So you typically will net the vineyard, net the, the grapes so that nothing can get in there. But animals are, you know, they will, they will find a way. Nature finds a way. So they will get in there and eat stuff. So you can lose crop to that. So essentially what you're getting is at the end of it, you're going to end up getting the, uh, maybe a sixth 
of or a fourth of your volume. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Now, could you please describe what the juice is like from these grapes? What's happening is when you squeeze those grapes is not only have you lost some of the liquid during the process of just by them sitting out there and drying slightly and desiccating, you are going to squeeze and what you're left over with is this super thick, somewhere between 35 and 40% sugar juice, which is basically syrup. And in the press, it's going to look like grape skin sorbet. So there's all this ice crystals that are left over. And that's one of the reasons you have to squeeze a certain temperature so that the water, a lot of some of the water that remains in the grapes stays in ice form and it doesn't go and dilute your, your ice wine. So what you're going to do then is bring it in and it takes a while for this to ferment. Um, it's a, it's a difficult situation. The what's called osmotic uh, potential or osmotic pressure. It, you know, the yeasts have cell walls and cell membranes that it gets, it's very hard with all that sugar. The sugar wants to go in at a rate to balance itself out and basically, uh, you know, diffusion. So it, it makes it very difficult for the yeast to even exist. So it takes a while for the fermentation to happen and it just results, but the, re, the results are this beautiful, uh, like ambrosia, like nectar of the gods, syrupy sweet, but you're not only concentrating your acid, you're not only concentrating your sugars, you're also concentrating the acid left over. So, you know, a good balance of ice wine is you need all that acid too. So it's got to balance, again, the balance point, it's got to balance itself out in the end. Wow, it sounds like an incredible process, but also a lot of work. Now, Michael, are there some other less risky ways to make wine that is similar to ice wine, but I think it has a different name, right? Could you please describe that? There are ways around doing the traditional ice wine, but you can't call it ice wine. You can call it iced wine or certain other things. And it makes a really nice little product, but people, what they do is at the end of harvest, they go out and pick grapes that weren't put at risk for um, getting eaten, weren't diluting them, you know, really diluting themselves and losing that water that you're losing during the desiccation process, um, weren't risking either bringing grapes in or weren't risking the fact that maybe it doesn't get cold enough. And they take it to a, a facility uh, and they cryogenically freeze it. So basically what happens is they put it in a giant freezer and then they wait until it's 20 some odd degrees one day and they bring it back and they squeeze it. And they're nice wines and they're much more affordable. So usually ice wines, iced wines are the $23 range and a true ice wine are just much more expensive. I mean, some of the ones that come out of Ontario are hundred some odd dollars, but they're perfect wines. They're like honey. You can open a you can open a bottle of ice wine leaving your fridge for a long time because it's not going to go bad. It doesn't go bad. It's just, it's, it's just, it's one of those fun things about it. So, you know, if you only, if you're only having a little sip of it, you can justify going out and spending all that money. So it's the risk reward thing. And the end product is you're getting this concentrated, beautiful thing that is is so worth it that uh, that's that's the thing. So that's that's the reason ice wine is done that way. Now, Michael, could you please talk about the type of grapes that Hazlitt uses for our ice wine? Typically around here, uh, we use Vidal Blanc as ours. Um, I really like Vidal because of many reasons. Um, it's very winter hardy. It's disease resistant. It has a has really nice. They have nice flavors. They call it Riesling's kissing cousin. Um, it's Got a lot of those peachy, appley, really nice elements to it. But it has, it maintains a higher level of acidity to, say, Riesling or a Cab Franc at maturation. So that when those grapes are done maturing and then it's, all the weather starts getting cold and they just kind of shut down, there's there's more acid to balance out that, that flavor. So you see a lot of Vidal Blanc. Um, you'll see a lot of, you'll see things like Riesling as well too. Riesling makes really nice ice wine. But you got to really make sure that the, the fruit is clean and, uh, and you know, you typically will pick it at a, a lower level of sugar or, a, a, you know, I wouldn't say lower level of sugar. You might squeeze longer to kind of get the sugar down a little bit so the acids will balance out. Cab Franc makes another nice one. They're really, one, really pretty ones. Um, but those are the, you know, the three big ones that we see in this area. But I've always, I've always enjoyed Vidal Blanc ice wines. Uh, just because of like, I think that balance is really nice and you can get, you can get it really, you know, almost like marshmallowy mar marmalade. It's, it's, it's almost like it's, it's, a, it's almost like the next step up from all, some of the other ice wines that you get They're They're really nice, pretty beautiful things with a lot of fruits and a lot of texture, but you can just kind of go that, you know, almost like creme brulee kind of, you know, it's like this tastes really, you know, this custard tastes really good. How would I caramelize and char some sugar on top of it? It's like that level to that next step up. So I would say that's probably a big thing with the ice wines. 
and we, yeah, we and we do uh, we do the traditional method. Um, I'm here, so that's yeah, yeah. Just kind of go out there and let the grapes just sit. And typically, it's with my with our luck, it's usually around the second of second of, uh, of January. Just like you just come off of winter break, we we uh, take Christmas to New Year's off. It's a rule. That's after after all the stuff that happens during harvest time and then you're getting all this stuff it get it's super busy until thanksgiving and then thanksgiving you come back and you're trying to get things kind of cleaned up and put in place to kind of walk away and give yourself a bit of a breather after three or three plus months of just craziness and you just you just want to come back and just basically just you know show up at the office show up at the winery start tasting some stuff it's like no no it's 20 degrees outside today and you're going to go outside and pick ice wine grapes and then you're going to sit outside for another 12 hours and squeeze the grapes and do that. So I think the last couple of times we've done the ice wine, it's been like the second or the third. And it's just like literally the day you're coming back from, from, from break. It's just like, of course it works out this way. Of course it's going to work out. So yeah, that's always a fun, fun element of it. But yeah, and it's, you know, it's when the weather, again, we don't have rules here in the States like they do in Canada, but they make some, they make the best ice wine out of sight of Germany. I think theirs is, you know, maybe even better than the Germans. And if, you know, if that's the rules they follow, you want to, you kind of want to follow into it. And also, you know, if mother nature, just like with harvest any other time, if mother nature says this is what's happening and this is when it's happening, you just, you roll with the punches. Now, could you please describe how the time when you pick the grapes for the ice wine can vary? Yeah. Um, it's, it, I mean, really, it, it depends on, it really does depend on the weather. I mean, if it's, if you've got, if you've got a potentially, you know, say what's say in the middle of January, uh, we had a warm snap come in. And all of a sudden, it's going to get warm. You know that could cause potentially some problems. Uh, if it's just super cold continuously, you're pressing outside. So if it's sub 15 degrees, you try to press grapes, and when it's zero out, nothing wants to come out. You're just sitting there and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. Uh, one year we picked, and then it, all of a sudden it got colder than it was supposed to. And I think I ran that press. The press was running for like a 24-hour period of time. I wasn't here the entire time, but it was pressing and holding and running, and I had, had it on a cycle. So, yeah. And then the equipment doesn't want to do stuff at that temperature, and you don't want to do stuff at that temperature. So that's kind of like that border spot. But uh, and, and sometimes, you know, it's it's just, again, it's, it's dictated by Mother Nature. Uh, you We've had, just coming back from Thanksgiving in 2008, we made an ice wine in 2008, and it had, it got super cold, and the decision was uh, to make it. And it was just, again, light and pretty, and it did not quite the style that we have typically make. But, you know, the the weather was going to get really, really cold, and then it was going to get warm again. So, you know, you got to, again, make that decision. If Is this our only opportunity? I know a number of years ago, it didn't get cold. It didn't get cold. It was a really mild winter. And there was a two-day two period of time, basically right there in January. It was like, okay... It's going to get cold tonight. Tomorrow is going to be just as cold. And then I think it was like a, maybe a Saturday or something. So it's like, all right, so we're going to pick. What we'll do is we'll pick Friday, in Friday afternoon, and we'll leave them in picking boxes outside so they're just as cold. And then Saturday morning, coming in and pressing the grapes off. And that was the only time that entire year that it got to those temperatures. So everyone did it. You know, everyone was, you know, across the board that was trying to do ice wine is picking that day. So no one decided to take that chance because they saw no indication that there was ever going to get back to that temperature again. And they didn't. And I want to say that that was like, that was just the winter that was beautiful that for us, at least, I think, I don't think it was above freezing or below freezing much of the winter. I want to say 95% of the winter was, you know, right at or above freezing. You get some snow and then it would melt a couple of days later. So there was no... There was no window to do it, so you just again dictated by Mother Nature, saying, "No, this is what this is what's happening." But yeah, typically, typically harvest happens somewhere between January, beginning of January, and and in February. Just going back really quick to the artificially frozen versus the naturally frozen ice wine. Could you please describe the different qualities the grapes have when they are left on the vine to freeze? So the artificially frozen stuff is you're going to concentrate those flavors you have at the end of harvest. So you're going to get that, you know, if you're doing Vidal or Riesling, it's going to be really, it's going to be peachy and appley and really nice and maybe a little floral, but you know, it, it's going to have fruit, a lot of fresh fruit characteristics um, and, and elements of things like that. Uh, be it ice, be it Riesling or Vidal or even Cab Franc, uh, you'll get, you know, white palm fruit or stone fruits or, you know, for 
Cab Franc will get red fruits. So you're going to get, you know, raspberry or some strawberry notes. So you're going to get those kind of things. Um, when you let them mature on the vine, especially with the whites, you're going to get more, like I said, marmalade. So that's, that's that cooked down processed apricot. So it's like apricot, but on steroids. It's, you know, it's a little different. There's a little more element to it. You get that truffle note, you know, not the chocolate one, but the, the, the fungus one in the background. You get, um, you get, you'll get things like, you know, a little more toasted sugar, uh, marshmallow kind of creme brulee aspect of it because those sugars are, you know, what's happening to them is they're, they're called reducing sugars. So when, you know, something browns, when you're baking, when you're baking thing at browns, when you're caramelizing sugar, or when you're doing that thing with the creme brulee, those are reducing sugars that get that brown sugary tones. So you're getting more of that. So there's just more complexity and depth from wines that are ice wines that are made from the traditional method. Um, and they can go anywhere from, you know, depending on how long you let it sit out there. Another o option is freezing cycles. So if the weather looks like it's going to stay, you're going to, you know, it's going to get to that temperature, but then warm up a little bit into maybe not freezing and then go drop back down. If you, the first flavor profile is going to be a little more fruit, a little more notes of those things I was talking about, the, the more complex things. And then if you do it the second time, you'll get a little less of the, the fruit fruits and you'll get a little more of those elements. And then if you do it a third time, it's like, oh, wow, you know, here's all that really deep, complex stuff that's going on. So, you know, that's kind of what's happening because as you let them freeze they harden up and the you know stuff the 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 water kind of disperses out because it was in the center and it disperses as it freezes and then it thaws the water's out there and then it's dry so now the water kind of comes out and then it freezes again so you're getting this in and out process that's going on and that's just kind of changing things so that's that's probably the biggest element of what what happens as you kind of sit there and let things go I guess, well, ice wine for the biggest things is, you know, you don't really know what's going to happen. It does depend on the season. So you hear the idea that, so this season ended up being different than the last season. You're going to make ice wine in both. Well, the grapes only got to this level of maturity this year and got to this level of maturity this, this, pat, this, the second year. Well, when you concentrate things, you're, you know, when you're, when you're doing that idea of basically the ice wine just being concentration of the season. So, you know, if it was a cooler, wetter, you know, less sunny year, you're going to have less concentrated or a slightly different aromatics and flavors um, as opposed to a hot, dry year. You know, they're going to ebb and flow. Uh, the big thing that we typically do is, you know, trying to, you know, look at, because you can always squeeze a little more, you can squeeze a little less, trying to look at similar sugar levels. That's a big element, especially in terms of texture and weight uh, and finished alcohol product. We use the same yeast. So, and it's a good workhorse yeast that's called EC1118 that is known to be, it's like, this is good for ice wine. It's a, it's also good. People also use it um, in secondary fermentations in champagne because it can deal with the more harsh conditions of either trying to ferment with a lot of sugar and then al alcohol on top of that or trying to ferment in a closed system that's already got 11% alcohol in it. So that's something that we typically do in the lab. But really it's, you know, don't try to put a right, uh, round peg in a square hole. Just, you know, let the wine be what it wants to be. You know, do your style, but try to, you know, try to try to just, you know, let, let what wants to happen happen and just guide the process and keep it going along. You know, there's a lot of different styles. Uh, I really enjoy our ice wine. Um, it's one, couldn't even tell you how many double golds and best of classes and best in shows and 90 points plus like 92 points, 93 points, 90 points from all the different publications. But I make it that more brown sugar style. And I, and I, and I think it's conducive to the grapes that come in and um, what it is. And then you've got over at uh, say Sheldrake, Dave Breeden, I think is the king of ice wines and his is, he, make, he picks it like he wants it like 35 and he does that a little more delicate style, but you know, he does it with Riesling. We don't do it with Riesling and it's just, it, they're just different. They're just different animals. So you just try to try to let it be what it is and just be true to your style. And, you know, they're, they're definitely going to be outlying years that are a little more, you know, this, you know, just like any year is exceptional for a red, like this was a great year for reds. Well, this was a, this apparently was a great year for ice wine, you know? So it's really kind of interesting to see, you know, it's, it's a whole nother season that you've got to have be um, agreeable to you. Not just the spring, not just, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not just the winter that you had, you know, typically 
You know, we've got the winter, which got to be pretty nice and not to kill the vines off or the buds. Then you're going to have springtime kick off at the right time, not be too hot or too dry, uh, but not be too cold with the frost. And you have the summertime, then you have the fall, and then you've got to go all the way back through winter again, basically to pick. So it's a full calendar year, so it can be even, it's even more difficult. So it can be, you know, when you have a good ice wine year, it's, it's not just eight months of the year that was ex- exceptional, it's a so full 12. So it's kind of funny that way. As you can see, there is quite a bit of work and dedication that goes into making both Hazlitt's ice wine and sherry, and that work is reflected in the intricate flavors. You can find both at Hazlitt's Tasting Rooms located in Hector, New York on the shores of Seneca Lake and in Naples, New York near Canandaigua Lake, both in the heart of New York's Finger Lakes wine country. Thanks so much to Tim and Michael for sharing their in-depth knowledge about these remarkable dessert wines. And a big thank you to Derek Strybig for the custom music and to the Winery's Marketing Director, Stephanie Jarvis, for the editing help. Of course, a huge shout out to our wonderful listeners for taking the time to learn about the inner workings of a family-run Finger Lakes winery. We hope you visit one or both the tasting rooms someday. I think the only thing that can make these delectable dessert wines better is great company. Yes, and yours too, Hoover. We hope you tune in next time to learn more about the people, processes, and community involved in producing wine at a Finger Lakes family-run winery. Until then, take care and cheers.